Good afternoon, everyone. Or really, no, sorry. Good morning. Good morning. It's morning, right? Good morning, everyone. We just want to go ahead and return from break because we have an awesome panel to get started. So if everyone could have their seats, get ready, get prepared. Now, here's the thing. Before I began, there was like this little thing about a cash app situation. And like, I just want to throw my cash out <laughs> out there, plus my Venmo. Um, and I accept like anything in the denominations of 50s. Thank, thank you, right? Yeah, so uh, let's just throw the cat. You know what, I, I, whoever just wants my cash app, I'll, get, I'll give it to you afterwards. We can do that that way. I just really, I think that was a great idea. Um, but just so we can go ahead and get started, I would like for us to welcome our panel moderator for this panel, which is about a generous spirit and black philanthropy. Um, our moderator for this panel is Kenneth Holmes. He's the senior vice, a senior vice provost for student life at the University of New Hampshire. Before, becoming, before coming to New Hampshire, Holmes was chief student affairs officer at Howard University. So please welcome Mr. Kenneth Cole. Kenneth Holmes. <laughs> Good morning, uh, everybody. Like many of you, giving is a big part of my life. I've been introduced uh, to giving ever since I was a child. If you remember the scripture, give and it shall be given unto you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And that's Luke 16 and 38. But despite the systematic exclusion of, black, of the black community from opportunities to build wealth and to obtain economic mobility in the US, the black community has consistently embodied a love for humanity and a habit of consistently giving in monetary and non-monetary ways. Today's panel has been asked to address from their perspective, a generous spirit, black philanthropy. And this panel is in honor of Louis Lattimore, who was an African-American inventor and a patent draftman. His inventions included evaporated air conditioning, process improvements for manufacturing carbon filaments for light bulbs and improving the toilet systems on railroad. Philanthropy has long been embedded in African-American tradition. To survive segregation and the Jim Crow era, Black Americans have given uh, through community churches, social and fraternal organizations, educational institutions, and mutual aid societies. Black philanthropy was integral to the development of black schools, banks, and businesses. For this panel, the presenters will discuss the rate and pattern of African-American giving outside of the traditional foundations and models. We have four very accomplished and successful panelists from both the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. I will give a brief bio in the order of our presenters and when they will present, starting with Bathia Carter, CEO and president of New England Blacks in, in, in Philanthropy, excuse me, which seeks to inform, reform, and transform the practice of philanthropy. 
Carter previously worked for the 50-year-old Association of Black Foundation Executives. Dennis Creary is the president and CEO of Blacks on Wall Street, Inc., a New York nonprofit he founded in 2014 to close the professional opportunity gap by providing underrepresented youth the resources to achieve promising careers. Wendy McNeil, she'll be joining us virtually, is known for not known in nonprofit circles for being creative and yet uh, collaborative as an executive leader with knowledge of all phases of nonprofit management and fund development. As a consultant, she has worked in partnership with staffs, volunteers, and trustees to raise more than $40 million during her career. And last but not least, Richard Ober, who leads the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, the largest private provider of nonprofit grants and student aid in Northern New England. He has been recognized with awards from environmental protection agencies, the state of New Hampshire and Plymouth State University. He has repeatedly been named one of the state's most influential people by leading New Hampshire business publications. So we will start our panel with Padaya. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I really appreciate you opening with scripture. I uh, know it's a beautiful thing. Um, and, and one of the reasons I appreciate that, today is my Sabbath. I grew up in the Adventists. And as I was driving up and I was thinking about this conversation and what I was going to talk about, it reminded me of a few things. It reminded me of fall in Cleveland, Ohio, going to church. And when we went to church, we not only funded our church, we funded missions. We funded our HBCU, Oakwood College. We funded a number of things. So part of my whole being, from being a child, I knew that I had to give. Whether, and it wasn't just giving of my tithes, the 10%, but it's really thinking beyond, what is my greater community? Who am I in service to and how do I, and how do I manifest that? So as you're looking at the slide and it says the legacy of us, and I really do think about this as the legacy of us. And if we could go back to that first slide for a moment. You know, some people see it as the legacy of the US, which is the legacy of us. Or you can see it as the legacy of your community, and that's the legacy of us. But too often, we are often parsing out black philanthropy and black history from American history. And we are American history, as we go to the next slide. We, in our work, we try to think about how do we not only inform, reform, and transform the practice, but what do those words mean? And it means that we need to take a shift, a shift from the way we normally see things as diversity, equity, inclusion as a side dish, maybe like mashed potatoes that are pretty buttered and good that you're looking forward to, but it's not really the main part of that meal. It's something you can live with or without, and that's not who we are. But it's also, we're looking at how does the, how did our work really not only serve as a mainstream, but as part of the time, talent, treasure, but also ties and testimony of this country? And we sometimes miss the testimony. We see it sometimes as, I don't know, critical race theory. I don't know, an extra course we have to take without understanding if it weren't for us, there would be no U.S. And that's the part I want to really think about. And, and think through this as in not just what can we do for those communities? How do we build wealth in those communities? But you need to know that we all have resources. And we have resources and opportunities to build the spirit of this country going forward. And as we go to the next slide, one of the things that I think about is that quoted at the top. We got to keep an eye on the past and the future almost at the same time so we can move forward. I have been so blessed to be a part of the work that Jerry Ann has been doing here for a long time. And one of the things that struck me, I don't know if you recall a long, long time ago when they did the film The Shadows Fall North. And I think that was the first time that this region really thought about what 
was it like to be black here? What was the significance of not only the Underground Railroad, but our history here? That's why the trail is important. How do we look at the assets of blacks in New Hampshire? And, to, and not just see it, again, off to the side, but what really happened here that helped to create this region? So one of the things that we have been really focused on in our reports that we call Giving Black, we have a Giving Black series, is not just black philanthropy today, not just what happened in the 60s, but let's look at the whole trajectory of black philanthropy. How did we come here? What happened? And how did it impact our communities? Next slide. One of the things that we think about in this 400 year history is starting at that top. So when we think about 1619 and the 20 odd slaves that came or enslaved people that came, because they weren't slaves, they were enslaved. We start thinking, oh my goodness, those people were in bondage and then slavery just happened. That's not true. Many of those, half of those people actually won their freedom, got their freedom. They went on to work. They went on to start farms. And when we think about the, the arrival of Anthony and Isabella, who then had the first child on this land, he, we started giving immediately. In the 1670s, we started suing the U.S. government for our citizenship. We, and then we were so, we have, were so prolific and we were really moving things forward that in the 1700s, we became a threat. So then we saw laws that actually entered on the books that said we could not serve in positions of power because we were gaining power. We could not serve in positions of, in church or civil or military where we were gaining um, authority over whites. And we have to think about that. And why we have to think about that, because we have to really contemplate what was going on. We didn't just end up like this because we had hardworking whites and then black people that just couldn't figure it out. And so here we are, and we have to make a path. We ended, the, we ended up in this space because we were blocked, like other people were blocked when they came here, but we were blocked in different ways, right? We were blocked even in our own history that we don't learn about more than just Harriet Tubman that were on the um, Underground Railroad, that we actually freed more of our own people through our time and our talent and our monies that we put together through churches, through social groups. We freed our people and we brought them north. We, we moved them in ways that aren't always a part of our history. We even during that time raised money to send overseas to even the, the um, Irish famine. There was a group in Richmond, Virginia that actually raised money to actually help people overseas and building their own country. This is the type of history we need to get comfortable with if we're really gonna think about us going forward. And when we think about the beginning of the Great Migration, I'm sorry about, um, it's shifting a bit. We should have put it in a PDF. But the PDF also brought more resources north. And it wasn't just jazz music. It wasn't just great food. But it was really in inventions that were happening during that time. And as we think about, the, and, and also the funding that came with it, as people would get, as freed people were coming together to create their own societies, the black or colored odd fellows that were alongside the white odd fellows, during that time, we are helping to build the U.S. and build school systems, school systems that were modeled after black school systems. For example, in Cincinnati, in the late 18, in the 1800s, when the black people weren't allowed to go to schools with whites, black people got together to build their own school system under Mr. Harlan. The school system worked so well that Cincinnati public schools then sought to dismantle it and actually take on what they have learned from that school system to model their own public school system. This is the history, this is the philanthropy that we have to get comfortable with if we really want to change in the future. And thinking about the civil rights era starting really in that 50s until now, that we're really thinking about why black philanthropy matters. If I can go to the next slide, please. This 
we have been a part of not only the beginning, but we brought through a different way of thinking about philanthropy, not just from the giver being at the top and the receiver at the bottom, but how do we think about horizontal philanthropy where both are equal, the giver and the receiver being the same, because it's just an exchange of resources that's asking for another exchange of resources. We learn how to center our churches and mutual aid groups and societies differently. And just as we talked earlier that Ken said, that we established churches, we provided relief. We were protesting against police brutality from the start in the 1800s. We have been protesting and thinking about how could we live in a more equitable society since the 1700s. So as we move forward in this legacy of us, <clears throat> What we have tried to do, and, you, and this conversation will actually will get better going forward, as you'll hear from others, we have been thinking about how do we tell this history differently, that this is not a critical race theory, but this is actual history. You can't, it's not some, a theory, this happened. So we want to inform philanthropy. We want to analyze what is happening in our communities. We want to amplify the information that we receive, because we believe that action plus advocacy equals change. But that action has to be informed by something. And as we go to the next slide, we have taken this something and, and really calibrated to these studies that we're doing in various cities, these giving back city studies, where we are thinking about donors differently. Who are our cornerstone different? donors, who are kinship donors, sanctified donors, how does that fit within the community to really democratize, build power, and change? And as we go to the next slide, as I wrap up, we've heard so many things thus far about this shift in philanthropy, that it has deep roots in our communities, that people understand it is not just a big check, but what is the service that you're providing? And the next slide, please. So now it's a blank screen and it's intentional because this is where you come in. This is where your shift comes in to start thinking about philanthropy as not just us, but all of us within the United States and how does all of our history not only sink in, but really anchors us to tell the true story about our communities so we can truly be equitable in the future. Thank you. check to see if this works. Oh, thanks. Morning, everyone. Morning. I'm really happy to see um, the turnout. Uh, thanks for, uh, for making the time over your days to attend. I really enjoyed your, um, your opening remarks on the history of, uh, of black philanthropy because we have been and continue to be a given community a giving people. So thank you very much for your time and your remarks. I also want to thank Jerry Ann Bogus for inviting me to this event. Uh, Jerry and I have a very special relationship. She happens to be my sister. <laughs> so thank you. Philanthropy means an awful lot in our family as well. There's six of us in the family, and three of us own our own not-for-profits. So um, we try and work together and, um, and do quite a bit. Uh, I founded um, Blacks on Wall Street about eight, nine years ago. Um, in 2008, there was a massive crash in the market, as you might recall. Subprime uh, uh, mortgages brought the entire markets down, not only in the United States, but across the globe. Um, I was working and selling to Wall Street at the time, and one of the things that I noticed 
was our numbers were depleted by 75% of those who were made redundant during that time. So I approached a customer of mine, Bank of New York Mellon, to start Blacks on Wall Street and calling it Blacks on Wall Street because we were the first Blacks on Wall Street as slaves that we were traded on Wall Street. Um, so I wanted to do this, but I wanted it to be uh, an area where we could try and replenish those 75% of the jobs that were lost. And they had a better idea. Uh, they said, why don't you market and target children? So I said, that's, that's an even better idea. So we started Blacks on Wall Street to um, look at truly underrepresented uh, kids in the tri-state area. And um, we focused on schools that had a 70% or less graduation rate, graduating rate. Because if they're in education, we realize that that's some sort of a magic number that they get absolutely nothing. They get less funds, everything. And those failing schools typically are in our communities. So a lot of our gems and diamonds in the rough are never discovered. So that's who we focused on. When I approached the schools, uh, we started with, I think, 80 students representing three schools. We now have 300 students coming through our ranks and about 275 schools branched out this year um, across the US in predominantly black neighborhoods, black communities, Atlanta, Philadelphia, etc. cetera. Um, what I like to tell the kids is when they see a Jamaican like me, there's no difference between someone from Haiti, someone from Trinidad, someone from the UK, someone from France who happens to be black, than us and, and, uh, and black Americans. We were on the same ship, we just landed on different shores. And and we face the same challenges. Nothing has, um, the same poverty rate um, is existent throughout each communities. And if you look at where we were taken from, they haven't fared any better uh, as well. Um, so this idea of giving back was something that we've practiced throughout our history. I'm bringing up um, Black Wall Street in, in, in Tulsa, and I'll give you a little <laughs> history lesson as to how it all uh, comes together. My, grandfather's brother, Uncle Raphael, fought in the Great War to end all wars, World War I. And he, I was very close to him. I was an army cadet and very close to him as he regaled me with um, stories of the war. But one thing stuck out in my mind was that as the war ended, he was not allowed to go directly back to Jamaica. He was sent to what in essence was a concentration camp in Italy, where they sent all those who fought for the British West Indies Regiment um, because there was this massive fear of armed black individuals, now well-traveled and versed, returning back to either the colonies or to their respective homes, the US, the UK, with that knowledge. There was this massive fear. So they didn't know what to do with these individuals. So they put them in a concentration camp until they had a mutiny and were then sent back. But they were sent to Cuba. And that's how a lot of Jamaicans ended up in Cuba. And some finally made it back to Jamaica. So that's what happened with the British West Indies Regiment. What happened to the US? Same thing. Armed individuals well-equipped, no well-traveled, came back to the US. Some were hung in their uniforms, but they went on and they founded um, 38, 30, between 38 and 40 communities that were self-sufficient. Black Wall Street in Tulsa was just one of the 
was the artist. And they were all fairly successful, which angered the neighborhood, the neighboring white communities. And each of them, during the red summer of 1919, was systematically destroyed. And that wealth has never been recaptured. So you look at all these communities, and I know it's an eye chart, but if you look at Red Summer 1919, it was an, a, a culmination, which might sound familiar, <laughs> culmination of a perfect storm against the black people in the US. We were coming off of the Spanish flu, massive epidemic, which our numbers were disproportionately affected as they was during this COVID-19, right? Um, for every forward movement we made, it seemed as if there were an equal reaction to pull us back, right? Um, so we have to look at how do we as black individuals, and again, that's why I loved your speech, you went through the history of it, giving back or giving black doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to create sustainable wealth for our respective communities. It's, it takes individuals like myself, my sister, in um, devoting our time in not only providing mentorship, um, but giving opportunities to our youth throughout the globe to, um, uh, to realize their full potential, of which there's a lot. Um, if you look at Africa today, the aid that goes into Africa uh, from just the US is about 162 billion. Okay, I see the stop sign there. Um, so I'll, I'll try and wrap it up very quickly. Yeah, aid into Africa is about 162 billion. Yet, about 203 billion <laughs> is taken from the continent. All right, and it is the richest continent uh, on the planet. All right, and the aid that comes in, in, in as far as loans go, these loans have to be repaid. So the wealth that we have in Africa, the same in the West Indies, um, keeps being depleted. And that cycle has been continuing um, since colonization, et cetera. And that also now has an adverse effect on the earning gap of black Americans in the US has remained about the same since 1967. Whilst the wealth of our compatriot white uh, Americans have been going up exponentially. That's because they have traditional um, matters of wealth. Um, you know, home ownerships, et cetera, a lot higher in, in, uh, in those communities than they are in our communities. All right, so these are the challenges that we're trying to address uh, for, uh, as we do with, with uh, Blacks on Wall Street. One of the statistics that I find very um, astonishing is that before the age of 25, a Black male, one in three Black American male will be incarcerated. And that is not, our women don't fear that much better. One in 10 will be incarcerated, right? And that depletes the Amer America of um, potential individuals who can be massive contributors to the bottom line of this country, right? So I won't go into that. Some of the programs that we do, um, we did a global economic symposium this year. Um, people were no longer afraid of uh, the name of my company, Blacks on Wall Street. And um, we were able to bring kids from these failing schools across the US, select um, the top three winners and bring them into uh, the New York Stock Exchange who we recently signed a contract with. And they were able to do the closing bell with 19 of the uh, presidents of HBCUs. And that, that alone, but that 
pales in comparison to the three kids that were living in a shelter in the South Bronx that we were able to send to university this year as well. That's the, again, just the importance of giving back. Um, thanks for your time. Is Wendy available? I'm here. <laughs> I'm, let's see. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. So thank you for having me this morning. I'm sorry I'm stuck in New Jersey. I live in Montclair and there's a lot going on in Montclair this weekend that made it impossible for me to uh, get there today. Um, but I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, uh, wonderful event, uh, Rita uh, Weathersby, G Gina Boker, and Terry Robinson were the three people who worked with me, so I greatly appreciate it. And I also appreciate the fact that my uh, good friend Nell Irwin Painter, the historian, artist now, uh, was the person who um, recommended that I be on this panel. So I am going to talk to you um, as someone who's been in the trenches, as it were. So I am a fundraiser. And I came to fundraising uh, pretty much from the back door, as it, uh, uh, as it were. So um, I was a grants giver. Uh, as when I started out. So my background is art history and I studied art history at NYU and at Rutgers. And I was fortunate enough to get a job as a grants coordinator with the New Jersey State Council on the Arts where I specialized in visual in the visual arts program. So, so when it came to uh, leaving that job, I realized that I had the skills or the knowledge of what is, uh, how donors think about how they give out their money. And so therefore I could switch my talents and go after the money because I knew what people wanted uh, from their, their grantees. So I began working uh, first as the um, um, director of development for the Montclair Art Museum, but I will save that story. Uh, for, for less in terms of how somebody like me could be um, an agent of change. Um, there are some positive things about being uh, in a position like me. So for, for one thing, I do major gifts and I do capital campaigns. And again, I got into it uh, uh, that aspect of it uh, through the back door, but really specialized on those two, two, two um, factors or two aspects of fundraising, which are the most highest paid aspects of fundraising, largely because I became a single parent. Um, I wanted to be in my son's life. I didn't want to have a traditional nine to five job. So I started my own um, little uh, consultancy firm. It was McNeil and Associates. And yes, I had associates. And I started out uh, by doing um, major capital campaigns. And that led into the major gifts aspect. So um, so that's so it was out of need. Um, and as a result, I know um, many, as my boss will attest to uh, the larger donors in the state of New Jersey. Um, there are the positive part about my work is that I can tweak a program so that I can tell the organization, what is the most fundable aspect about what they are doing or what they aren't doing. So, so I can make suggestions on enhancing their program. And that's really good because I can say, look, you don't have um, any, anything going on here for BIPOC kids 
or poor women and children. And you need to put that aspect into, into your program. Or we need to have a collaboration with um, a predominantly Black organization. Um, or we need to get this th these types of individuals involved in order to make the program more fundable. So that's very um, important, um, the type of power, uh, as it were, that, that someone like me has. Um, I also come to this game, as I call it, from a social justice background or, or training. Um, I was raised a Roman Catholic, um, and I was raised on the arm of the social justice aspects of, of Roman Catholicism. So someone like Henry Nowen, who was a Dutch Roman Catholic theologian who was very involved in social justice, um, is someone I followed. And I firmly believe that by talking to, in my situation, mostly uh, largely rich white people or super rich white people, um, and to tell them how to use their money um, is, is um, creating a better world. And I just want to quote to you something that um, Henry, that, um, that is in a book called The Spirituality of Fundraising by Henry Nowen. And he wrote, asking people for money is giving them the opportunity to put their resources at the disposal of the kingdom or however you, you wish to define that. And that is, uh, and in my uh, definition, the kingdom is creating a better world uh, for all of us. And to raise funds is to offer people the chance to invest what they have um, in the work of God and however you define God. And just a secret here, I'm a Unitarian Universalist now, so, so totally opposite, but the of Roman Catholicism, but um, this is something that, that is very much part of who I am. And he goes on to write, God's kingdom is the place of abundance where every generous act overflows its original bounds and becomes part of the unbounded grace of God at work in the world. So my job, as I've always seen it, is to talk to people about how best they can use their money to make their neighborhoods, their communities, and the larger world better. And that's very, very important to me. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. There is in the state of New Jersey, a very wealthy hedge fund person. And um, he is not Catholic and I was raising money for uh, the uh, ca uh, Catholic charities. And it came right after Hurricane Sandy, uh, which devastated uh, this state. And some will even say factually that uh, Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey was even worse. Uh, than Katrina in New Orleans to the state. So there was a great need uh, for food in our food banks. So this very wealthy man, again, one of the wealthiest individuals in the state, was going to give Catholic Charities $200, $200 gift certificates from targets that people could use. And so I remember hearing that and then uh, thinking to myself, if that's all he gives, I'm gonna go home and cut my throat. This is just not acceptable given how much money this man has. So, um, so my goal was to, to get Catholic Charities enough money so that they could buy food to put into their food banks so that they can have their, uh, their storage area, which was a really big uh, center in Newark, fully um, uh, full, absolutely full. Um, and so I remember spending a Sunday afternoon on the phone uh, with this man and giving him uh, the various reasons why it was important for him to uh, make an additional gift. Uh, to, to, to give to Catholic Charities so that they could 
uh, by food. Um, and I gave him the, the tonnage of food that we needed, not how, not a price behind it because it was a lot less, but the tonnage sounded better. And, um, and in the end, what he did was he gave uh, Catholic Charities a quarter of a million dollars to uh, buy food. And at the end of the conversation, he said, stop it, Wendy. Okay, okay. Uh, let's, you know, you're going to get this. And, um, um, and, and they did, and they were able to completely full, uh, fill their, their food bank. So that's some of the types of things, whether it's scholarship money um, at the Montclair Y. Uh, Montclair is, is a community I've lived in for over 30 years. It is perceived of as a very affluent community, but we do have um, uh, poor kids living in town and they deserve to go to the Y as well. So how do you get scholarship money for them? And that was something um, that I was tasked to do and did so successfully. Um, uh, some of the negative aspects of being in the trenches like me is, that um, you don't, uh, there aren't many of me, at least here in New Jersey. So when I go to uh, conferences with the Association of Fundraising Professionals of New Jersey, for example, I also do planned giving um, that, that sometimes I'm, there's a, a handful of, of uh, black fundraisers at this level. And that's something that makes it difficult because as you can well imagine, it's not all, always peaches and creams for a black person, especially a black woman to talk to super wealthy white people about their money and how they should use their money. So over the years, I have used many techniques on this um, sometimes I have another uh, white colleague or a white board member go out with me. Um, so, so there's a lot of ways to that that I've learned how to finagle that so that there could be a, a more of a comfort level, let's say, in them uh, talking about uh, their money to to somebody like me. Um, I firmly believe, um, however, that, that one can be an agent of change, especially when um, uh, things coalesce so that you, um, have, you can have a Black uh, fundraiser, a woke executive director or a black executive director um, and, and can make some, or, or a woke boss uh, who, and you can make some substantial changes in the organization um, with the combination of those, of those two ingredients. Um, right now in New Jersey, which is really a good thing, we have um, uh, several corporations um, who have black CEOs in their corporate foundations. And we have the three top uh, foundations in New Jersey have black leadership. And that's really, really important um, in terms of, of how they are uh, redefining philanthropy and the types of things that they are giving to. Right now, so I just want to give two stories. One is uh, with my uh, first position uh, with the Montclair Art Museum. Uh, when I started at the Montclair Art Museum, I was the first Black professional working there. So they had Black guards, but they did not have a Black professional. And I was their director of development and the executive director got me from the state council on the arts. And he, he realized that because I had an in with, with government funding that I was a, a, a good thing to have on staff. Um, and um, uh, one of the things, and he also knew my background as an art historian. 
So um, at that time, quite frankly, it was very easy to raise money for a museum like the Montclair Art Museum. And so I had time and I had time to do um, cur uh, cur curatorial work. And one of the things that I did was uh, curate um, an exhibition on African-American art. It was the African-American artists in the age of cultural pluralism. And it was the largest black show that they ever had um, at the Montclair Art Museum. Because I was the fundraiser, I raised money for the exhibition and I also raised money for the, um, the programs that went along. But the other thing that I raised money for was ac acquisition, acquiring Black art into the collection of the Montclair Art Museum. And that was just the beginning. So when I left, my boss, uh, the executive director, um, said that um, he wanted to do a Black committee. Um, and, and he created one and I served on it at the beginning and then my life expanded and I couldn't work on it anymore. But now if you go to the Montclair Art Museum, not only does it have an absolutely phenomenal collection of 20th and 21st century black artists, but it also does programs that is of interest to everybody in, in, in the community and in the state. And I think that's very important. I work for a um, public media station now. And again, the agency there, uh, when it came down to, um, uh, we, we aired Henry Louis Gates's program on the Black Church, and my boss said to me, boy, it would be really interesting to, to if we had time to do something um, uh, in, uh, in collaboration with that particular program, immediately, you know, as I, I may not be practicing Catholic now, but I certainly live in its aesthetic, I said, the Holy Spirit came to me and we are now going to do a program on uh, the Black Church in New Jersey. And it was the Black Church in New Jersey bending the art towards justice. And that led to a series of uh, one that dealt with Black philanthropy. And we got Jonathan Holloway, who's the president of Rutgers involved in that. And next Wednesday night, if I may plug it, we are doing a, a absolutely phenomenal panel on Black wealth and equity in New Jersey. New Jersey has a $300,000 gap between Black and white people. And we are going to put that front and center to, to our audience. So that's a great um, plug. That's a great plug. Wendy. Yeah, thank you. So, so lots of really good things. And it's not easy, the type of work that I do. I don't, it's ironic. I don't encourage people to do it, but I have to tell you, my son is a grants writer. So go figure. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kenneth. It is just really, really good to be here. Um, I have to say I've been humbled the last couple of days by just the brilliance of the speakers and of all of you, this blend of scholarship and humanity. Um, what someone said yesterday, simultaneously infuriating and invigorating. Um, this has just been quite an experience. I want to show you something. Um, so I wrote down and then printed what I was going to say today. And based on the last two days, that's what my remarks look like now. Um, this is real life learning and, and adapting. So um, I'm actually going to talk less because you just heard from these remarkable panelists. I'm going to talk less about Black giving outside traditional models and more on the imperative of change in traditional models. 
And I was thinking of what Matthias said about informing, reforming, and transforming philanthropy and the work of foundations like the one I work for. I believe that foundations in the 2020, in the 2020s are in a profound paradigm shift, a paradox, maybe even an identity crisis. This tension is leading to transformation in many, uh, certainly not all. And here's what I think it looks like. On the one hand, wealth resides the wealth that resides in most organized philanthropy, the wealth that resides in most organized philanthropy, the well-intentioned, was built on the fundamentally inequitable, often racist, anti-Black economic and social systems that we've heard so much about in the last two days. On the other hand, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars that could help dismantle those systems and build more equitable ones. For many foundations today, the top three themes in philanthropy are equity, racial justice, and decentralizing power. That cuts across all issue areas, social mobility, the climate and environmental degradation, education, justice reform, health, democracy, arts and culture, no matter what a foundation works on. And these three themes of equity, racial justice, and decentralization of power have to go beyond just the grants we make. It's not a program. It's not a side dish, as Matthias said. They to be integrated into our culture, into our staffing, into our investment strategy, into our business model, into our governance as foundations. And fundamentally behind all of that is a core question is who gets to decide where these assets should go and how they should be distributed. That's the journey we are on at the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. You know, and making these shifts is hard enough in a private foundation where you might have one donor, think Henry Ford, think Bill and Melinda Gates, a very small board, frankly, often two family members and an executive director make up the boards of private foundations and a paid staff. They can choose an issue or two and they can make changes. Some are doing that and frankly, many are not. But for a community foundation like ours, it's much more complicated, much more critical, and potentially, I believe, more transformational. Um, you met one of the great leaders in phila community philanthropy last night in Jay Williams. So we are a public charity. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, not a private foundation. That is a real difference. We don't have one fund at our foundation. We have more than 2,000 individual charitable funds set up by more than 2,000 New Hampshire individuals and families uh, since 1962. And those funds cover the full range of public needs, the environment, health, education, arts, culture, mobility, the whole suite. They range in size from $10,000 to $100 million. So think of our foundation as a large foundation with lots and lots and lots of little foundations within it. Some of them were set up to support a single nonprofit, some for specific topical areas. Many of them are donor advised funds where the donors recommend where the grants go. And in that case, as Wendy was saying, our staff is in the position, has responsibility to help those donors guide where those dollars should go for the greatest impact. At its best, and at, like all nonprofits, we are governed by a volunteer board of directors, including Jerry Ann. So at its best, community foundation should be philanthropy of, by, and for the people of a place. In our case, that's New Hampshire. We are New Hampshire's community foundation, and we are accountable to the entire community. So we've been asking some big questions. 
Are we tackling big enough problems at their root causes? Whose voices have been excluded from decision-making in our communities and at our foundation? And what have we missed from that absence? How can we work more collaboratively and effectively with the community, with nonprofit partners, with the donors who set up these funds at our foundation? And interrogating traditional notions, as Bathia said, about giver, receiver, giver, receiver. So Jerry Ann asked me to tell you a little bit about where we are. Um, we have recently adopted a new, very comprehensive plan. It's called Together We Thrive. You can find it on our website. It has a singular, singular purpose, to make New Hampshire a more just, sustainable, and vibrant community where everyone can thrive. And to achieve that purpose, we are centering equity and racial justice in everything we do, or we're trying. That's because we know that way too many people in this state um, face barriers, very high barriers to basic rights and the ability to thrive based on race, based on gender identity, wealth, age, geography, sexual orientation, immigration status, and ability. And we've named that race and racism is the foundation of all of those inequities. And to lower those barriers, we have to understand them. Naming that in one thing, it, naming that is one thing, Writing a plan is one thing, changing is another, especially for a mostly white-led organization struggling with our own dominant power structures. So I wanna give you very quick glimpse into six or seven things we're do doing and then close. So number one is to elevate community voice, to share decision-making, to decentralize decision-making with those most affected by the inequities that we hope to address and to create solutions together. We have many ideas for how to do that. We've started some things. Some of you are helping us think, some of you in this room are helping us think that through. We are aligning our investment strategies um, across all of our invested funds, and there's a lot of them. So we use all of our assets to advance opportunity and equity, not just the six or 7% that is distributed into the community every year. We are embracing trust-based philanthropy. One way we're doing that is over the last several years, shifting to multi-year operating grants for the bulk of the grants we make. We wanna make the grants to good organizations and get out of the way. We've adopted a new grant-making policy that take, goes well beyond our current policy on discrimination. This is a grant making policy on discrimination, hate and exclusion. Go beyond known hate groups. We will make no grants that are contrary to our purpose and values as New Hampshire's Community Foundation. We want to more deeply understand the work and the barriers of BIPOC led grassroots organizations in New Hampshire lower those barriers to accessing the grants we have. My colleague, Sandeep Bikram Shah, who's with me today, is uh, my top advisor on that. Our board has adopted something called purpose-driven board leadership. And for you, for those of you who are on nonprofit boards, I encourage you to look at this. It was written by Ann Wallace-Dott from Board Source uh, two years ago. I've been in nonprofits my whole life. I honestly think this is the most important transformation for nonprofit board gov governance. There are four principles to purpose-driven board leadership, and our board has adopted these as our governing principles. One, purpose before organization. Two, equity mindset in all we do. Three, consider the impact on the broader ecosystem of every decision. As a large foundation in a small state, our decisions can have positive consequences, they can be meh, and they can have negative consequences. And fourth, consider authorized voice and power, who is making decisions within your organization. We have done things like eliminating deadlines for our scholarship programs because young people, especially young people who are facing obstacles, can't 
we cannot expect them to adhere to a certain deadline for so students seeking scholarships, especially for community colleges, um, have no, long, no more deadlines. And we are deepening our commitment to advocacy, to public policy, to systems change, including tackling some of the most deeply inequitable policies in this state, starting with how we fund public education. We're wading into that water. So to close, um, th there's lots more examples of what we're doing and we need your help, we need your voice. We have a long, long way to go. But to close, it's like, where does the money reside? Um, some of the philanthropic capital in New Hampshire resides at the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, a community foundation. So we need to understand and reflect what the community needs to thrive together. That's our commitment. We're gonna make mistakes, but we are deeply committed to learning, listening and adapting. And for me, the last 24 hours has been a big part of that journey. Thank you. Now we're part, now we're to that portion of the program where we'll be taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. And for those that are online, um, if you can, Terry, um, just read those when they're available. We have a question here in the back. Um, yes, Richard, you talked about the donor advice funds at New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. I'm wondering if you and the rest of the panel can speak, explain more about donor advice funds and what they are, because it's really been making me angry the past few years, <laughs> and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to start. So donor advice funds are a curious animal because they're, they are one tool sponsored by very different types of institutions. So you can open a donor advised fund at Merrill Lynch or at Fidelity Charitable. You can open a donor advised fund at your alma mater, probably, or you can open one at a community foundation. A donor advised fund is a fund where the donor makes a significant gift of charitable assets and gets the benefit of the charitable tax deduction at that time, and then recommends grants that come out of that fund to the institution that holds them. So we hold about 500 donor advised funds. Some of the concerns about donor advised funds is you can put the money there and you don't have to recommend any grants and you've gotten your break and you can let it sit so at community foundations like ours, we do not let that happen. We have a policy that donor advised funds have to make regular grants. If there's no grant that has come out of the fund over a course of three years, we will make, we just simply make the grant. Um, but there hasn't been a recommendation. Um, we have very, very few donor advised funds that don't make grants virtually every year some other institutions do tend to let them sit. Payout rates of donor advised funds is an important thing. The average payout rate of donor advised funds in America is 16%. The average rate of a university endowment is four and a half percent. The average private foundations have a minimum payout of 5%. So on aggregate donor advised funds actually pay out quite high, but there are abuses. Like anything else, there are abuses where the, the, the grants are not coming out of the funds. Some people undoubtedly have used these as a tax dodge. We believe they're very powerful tools uh, when we work directly with the donors who establish them at our nonprofit organization. Any other comments? Yes. Um, I don't I also want to add donor advised funds from my point of view are a very interesting, powerful tool as in who has voice. And you know, one of the things that we are arguing for, does the amount to open a donor advised have to be 
X amount of dollars. So as we're thinking about democratizing philanthropy, you know, there's a way that we can use these funds, as Dick has said, to not only think about who's giving, and I really applaud your community foundation for doing that. So, because many foundations do not require you to spend because that's how they get to tell you how much they have or their assets under management. We're now a billion dollar community foundation because the majority are donor advised. So I commend you for doing that and really being a part of the public. But donor advised is one of those places of power where one can not only decide where they're giving, but also influence others where they're giving as well. We are um, cr creating a report for the Boston community, Giving Boston, and we interviewed many of the donor advised, uh, we interviewed many people who had donor advised to ask them, where are you getting your information? <laughs> Mostly it's a whisper from someone's ear. Many times it is the community foundation itself saying, make a donation here. But what they are lacking is a general, some sort of general ledger of really being able to sit, understand what is needed in the community and how they can invest in the community. So I think that there is an opportunity to do a lot more here to expand equity as in how do we open more donor advice so everyone can be a part of the party? How do we actually help these people decide where to give money? And that is not just a hidden sort of elite tool, but it's a tool for everyone. Then it's a Wendy. I, yeah, I would just like to say something, I think, that with a lot of, of, of donors in the um, uh, black community in particular, that the, the assets that they don't, they, and I know very wealthy people, very wealthy white people who feel this way also, who may come out of a very poor background, that they just don't feel psychologically that they can give away their money. Um, and, and that's, um, and, and how impactful, let's say a hundred dollars is to an organization versus something that's a lot more. And I think, um, the education goes into saying that even the smaller amounts of money, um, is significant as well. Um, and the problem with donor advised funds is someone told me they're here to stay. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, uh, with, with somebody like me, we like to get to know the donor, the individual behind the DAF versus the organization that's managing it. But it's something that, that the industry has been dealing with. Thank you. your mic on? Is this better? Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> As I was saying, we, we typically at Blacks on Wall Street don't um, use or avail ourselves of donor advised funds. We um, work directly with corporations and their uh, community reinvestment programs and um, we take their money from there. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me, talking, fun. Um, well, first I wanna thank you both, or all of you for the work that you do in philanthropy to help kind of shift the systems um, at work there. Um, I do a lot of work on tax policy, which has a lot of issues too with how money has been used across history and across geographies. Um, but when you think about things like education funding, as you mentioned, Richard, the, the issues are bigger than what philanthropy can solve. Um, but in tax policy, often there is a pushback for increasing tax revenue by saying that wealthy people can just give money um, into their communities and that's the best way forward. Um, so any thoughts or reflections that you all would share on that relationship between um, consistent tax revenue and philanthropy and how they can work together to improve funding for communities? So thank you so much for that question. You know, I love the title of this um, panel. Um, and you may think, what's, 
how is it related to taxes? Um, you have a book, I think, in the background by Dorothy Brown, The Whiteness of Wealth. And really what she's talking about is tax policy and how tax policy has been used in our community kind of against us. And you're right, we're not just going to, philanthropy is a small part of the dollars that really are coming into our communities and taxes are a growing part. I think we need to get involved in taxes and stop waiting for the policies to come to us and then we respond to them, that we need to get in front of them and start to say what is needed in our community. The other fascinating thing to me about philanthropy's relationship here, philanthropy is like a that is kind of like innovation funds, right? This is where you can use funds to really try to do small things and try to shift small policy and move your legislators, right? As we think about philanthropy beyond just a dollar to a organization, but philanthropy is time, talent, treasure, ties, who are we tied to and testimony and what are we saying? And I think we need to get really focused on that particularly in tax policy, that we're the writers of the tax policies, that we're pushing that message forward, that we're using our voice and our ties so that we're not just responding to it, but now they have to respond to us. We really need to envision ourselves differently. And I think that's the point of even this conference and this panel, the generous spirit, the generous spirit beyond what is just for me, but the generous spirit of pushing us to see a better future for all of us. Oh, wait. Or we have one here. Yeah. Okay, right there. I'm sorry. Hi. Um, thank wait, you. Uh, this, I'm, this is Joan Brodsky again. I, I asked a question yesterday. Um, I appreciate all of you and Dick. Your comments were particularly um, meaningful to me because one reason I was attracted to come to this conference was I serve on several boards and I, there's talk about equity and inclusion and representation, but no one knows what to do. Now, I made a friend yesterday, Doug in the room, who thought he, he could help as a consultant, but I need more help. And also, I really, it was so meaningful to hear your purpose-driven board leadership, and you said them so fast, before, uh, purpose before org. So do you mind repeating those? Uh, uh, not Thank at you. all. So the first is purpose before organization. So when a board is grappling with the question, are you trying to protect the organization, or are you trying to achieve your purpose? Second is equity mindset that the board, not just the paid staff, the board has to have a deep commitment to equity in everything they do. The third is consider the ecosystem, that your decisions as a nonprofit board have ripples through the broader ecosystem. And the fourth is authorized voice and power, which might be the most important, and that's who is actually at the table making the decisions and who is informing those decisions and all of that. Um, Purpose-driven board leadership, board source, one click away, excellent article. It also has some exercises that boards can take themselves through to test their willingness to commit to that. Thank you. Understanding. All right. So, lady in the uh, sweater. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm being told to sit down and stand up, so I'm trying to figure out my place here. Um, I have a question that's actually just personal to my field and wanting to know about behavioral health and mental health innovation and aspects of phil um, philanthropy. Thank you. Um, one thing that I see as a clinician, and I work with mostly black, indigenous people of color is that people come to me due to what's happening in society. And as a clinician, I am therefore supposed to give someone a diagnosis. And so I often say, what am I supposed to do? Give someone an adjustment disorder diagnosis to someone who's struggling with systemic racism or a generalized anxiety disorder. And so two things happen to people who pay for um, 
mental health services, they have to use their insurance. It requires a diagnosis. It requires a pathology for their internalizing internalized depression. Or they self-pay. And sometimes that's not economically affordable. And a spe specifically for children who are self-paying, because that can follow them on their records and prohibit them from getting careers. And there needs to be a different way of treatment to address weathering, to address race-based traumatic stress, which is not a diagnosis in the DSM-5. And so how can we find philanthropy? How can we change the behavioral and mental health care systems using philanthropy? Philanthropy, yeah. Use the money. Yes. <laughs> Who want to take that one? So I'll try to do this as quickly as I can. Um, tying that earlier question and Bethia's wonderful remarks, philanthropy is pretty good about dealing with symptoms, you know, little bits of band-aids here and there to try to salve the pain and destruction of fundamentally flawed economic and social systems and health systems. We have to do more than that. We have to try to get at root causes. Um, one of the reasons community philanthropy is so interesting is we have all these different funds. We, had a, we have one of our fund, it's actually our second largest fund established in the late 1990s, expressly requires our foundation to stay focused on substance use disorders and related behavioral health challenges and specifically requires us, this is really unusual. The donor who set this up said, not just more money for more services, because that's government's job, getting back to tax policy, but advocate for systems change so we can get at that root causes. Um, so we have a full-time person who leads our work. Her name is Tracy Fowler. You can find her on our website. We have a comprehensive uh, working with many partners, including the Endowment for Health, um, comprehensive approach to how we can both try to keep addressing symptoms, but get at those fundamental policy changes. Because you're right, how do you fix the trauma of racist systems, of a two and a half year pandemic of anxiety over climate change? They are broader forces. But I want to, I, I agree, Richard, I mean, Dick, um, and I commend you for doing that. And I, my friends at Endowment for Health, I commend them as well. But philanthropy helped create it. So the eugenics movement, right, helped push that forward. It was funded through Ford Foundation. It was funded at cohort, Cold Harbor Springs in New Jersey. Philanthropy is, has, has had its space or its aura or its fragrance everywhere. And we have to stop thinking of philanthropy as just charity, that we have to shift our mindset to what is this spirit of philanthropy that we want to carry through? Because philanthropy helped create this. So how do we help philanthropy undo this? Mm. We'll have one more question. Yeah. So sir. could I just respond to that as well? And we're, we're here at a university. Um, so, you know, about education. So the, the issue is, is to always be out there educating people, always be out there telling people, these are the problems. This is how we make, instead of just a superficial change, but a systemic change to get to the roots of the problems. And so just see yourself as an educator um, and be out there talking to people. I'm very involved as a, I'm a fundraiser in my professional life, but in my personal life, I'm very much an activist in my community. And I care about affordable housing and reparations, quite frankly, are those are my two key issues right now. And, and I'm constantly talking to people about those issues and, and how they can make an impact. And I think that's what's really important is, is the education process and, and going for the long game. 
um, and to you know just just see that this is a process, um, but it's a process that also includes educating people. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to just make one one comment because maybe you can assist me. Um, I find it very difficult within our community to convince youngsters or even even their parents to seek mental health. Mm -hmm. right? As a community, it's not something that we normally do. There's a stigma associated with that. You speak to someone who's a member of a church, but my pastor is my psychiatrist, right? So if, if you have any ideas, any thoughts on A, how to convince this community that that is important um, uh, to get done, I, I would definitely, um, definitely appreciate that. And then B, the second thing is when they do seek assistance after you've convinced them there are not many that look and sound like them in that field and they're not comfortable sharing that with others outside uh, yeah the panelists will be here we have one more question we're um almost out of time and so the gentleman in the black shirt if he can give his question this will be the last question I, I, I want to direct this basically, I'll, I'll try to be quick, uh, to Bithia and to Wendy. Wendy, I'm a New Jersey boy, South Jersey. Uh, I'm also the fifth grandson of a black slave, okay, from Salem, New Jersey, Cuffy Cuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, several years to Salem, uh, the, the historical society there gave grant money to a, a woman who went off to do some black history type thing. And my, my question is, is there uh, philanthropy money for black history preservation, okay? Because uh, she took me to the home, the foundation of Cuffy Cuff, who was a slave, whose son was Reuben Cuff, okay? Who's now my fourth generation, who was the only representative from New Jersey, from the AME to go to Philadelphia right. and start the AME Church Society, right. mm -hmm. okay? She took me to the home that's still there. Mm -hmm. and it's privately held, but it's back yep. and, and it, no one's taking care of it. Right. And, and, and there's also a Cuff Cemetery, that's right. okay? And I, I started years ago researching my family yep. around Southern New Jersey. So from Marshalltown, yep. another yep. Springtown, Greenwich, Salem, Port Elizabeth, yep. all my family is all there. And I'm, and I'm working now on trying to put that into, into the uh, Underground Railroad. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And so my question is, and I'd like to catch up with this later, <laughs> is there any philanthropy for, you know, the, the black historical thing? Because right now I know the cemetery the town try to take it over, mm. okay? And, and so I'm, I'm all bubbly just listening to you guys, okay? So yeah. I'm gonna be brief, because I know Wendy has knows better than I do. The answer is yes, right? Because it's the same money that supports white history. Mm -hmm. And it's the same money that you go right to all those little homes that has a plaque and this preservation and the national this, that, and a third. We should never be a side dish. We are American history. This takes us right back to the front. So the answer, short answer is yes. Go to your community foundation. Go and get those same dollars from preservation. And I'm going to let Wendy take it from here because she's briefly, smarter than I. Briefly, briefly. Yeah. Okay, real briefly. So just uh, one plug, NJPBS, my employer did a two-part documentary called The Price of Silence slavery in new jersey it's excellent go online and you can see it um in montclair right now we're trying to preserve the how house which was the uh, a house that was owned by a, a first generation former slave and i agree that there is money out there and if somebody could give this man my my email address i will guide him to it awesome but if we can take this time to thank our panelists, uh, Dennis uh, Creary, Mathia Carter, uh, Wendy Mc, 
uh, McNeil and Richard Ober. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>